our schedule today. Uh, my name is Paul Pope, and uh, I'm not going to introduce our speaker. I'm going to introduce the person who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, it's great to see a, a, a good crowd on the Monday after Thanksgiving. I'm proud of you for you know, you guys that literally gained five pounds one day. <laughs> so um, I'm going to make my introduction a little bit more personal than I normally do because um, I'm introducing Taylor Ham, who is a um, Brumley fellow that I've known now for quite a while, and I've had her in a professional research project that we did a quite extensive one, and got to know her very well there. Um, spent this is all during the pandemic, so we spent a lot of hours flying Zoom together, and uh, and then she served as my teaching assistant in a large undergraduate class. One thing about Taylor, if you don't mind me saying this, is um, people come to graduate school with different agendas. Some come knowing exactly what they want to do and being trained on it, and some come and know generally what they want to do and then sort of discover things. And Taylor has um, continued to refine her interest, and it's just been great to, and, and very rewarding for me as a teacher to see her journey to a point where I now consider a real expert on a number of issues some of which we're going to talk about today. So Taylor, could I ask you to come introduce our speaker, please? Thank you, Professor Pope. And he actually stole my joke that I was going to tell. That thank you for joining the Monday after Thanksgiving, probably after eating turkey all weekend and everything. So, but yes, I'm very happy for all of y'all to join us today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Anna Borshevskaya um, here to give her talk on um, Russia's global influence um, in the Middle East, specifically in Syria. Um, a little about a little bit about Dr. Borshevskaya. Um, she's currently a senior fellow at the Washington Institute. Um, focusing on Russia's policy in the Middle East. Um, in addition, she's also a contributor uh, to Oxford Analytica um, and a fellow at the European Foundation for Democracy. Um, she was previously with the Atlantic Council um, and the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, she was also serving in Afghanistan with a military contractor where she did um, public, where she did research and anal uh, analysis on public um, opinion interviews and um, things like that. Um, she recently um, she recently published um, a book called Putin's War in Syria. I uh, highly recommend it. Um, it is a very interesting take on um, Russian foreign policy in Syria and then also um, gives very good um, analysis on America's position and what we could be doing better. Um, it is on Amazon uh, at the moment. And um, yeah, so I highly recommend that. Um, she has also published things in Foreign Affairs, The Hill, The New Criterion, and the Middle East Quarterly. Um, and she has also served as well on the American, um, the American Islamic uh, Council, I believe, and Congress. Congress, American Islamic Congress. So with that, please welcome Dr. Borshevskaya, and um, we're happy to have you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, I uh, am going to start uh, my talk um, before I dive, dive into Russia and Syria uh, on a few broader uh, issues relating to Russia and Russian foreign policy, and then I'll zero in uh, on Syria. Uh, the reason why I uh, began uh, researching Russia in the Middle East to begin with is because uh, historically, um, it, since the end of the Cold War, basically, uh, most analysis uh, on Russia has uh, tended to be skewed more in, in terms of its relationship with Europe. And there hasn't been enough attention to uh, Russia in the Middle East. Um, so I saw this as a gap in research and scholarship, and I thought, and to me, this was a fascinating topic that I wanted to research. Um, the, because the fact of the matter is, um, uh, historically, the Russian state uh, worried uh, and cared about not only its relationship with Europe, uh, but also uh, to, uh, to its relationship with what, what, they, what is called the South, basically uh, Central Asia, the Caucasus, and the Middle East. So if you think about region, regions that are South of Russia. Uh, historically were just at least as important uh, to the Russian state, if not perhaps more, 
Uh, it is a region that uh, where the Russian rulers have all, always felt vulnerable uh, for one reason or another. And because of that, uh, they cared about that part of the world. Uh, so it's incredibly, if you want to look at, uh, if you want to study Russia and understand Russian foreign policy, it's important to look not only at Europe, but also at, at it, to its relationship with the South. And um, because of Putin's Syria intervention, perhaps there's now a lot more attention to what Russia is doing in the Middle East. And I, I hope that uh, that attention remains because that attention is very necessary. So um, uh, a few points uh, that I wanted to start with um, in this regard. Uh, since basically most of its existence as an independent polity, the Russian state uh, was present uh, in the Middle East and, and had relations uh, with this region and with the Muslim world uh, for a whole host of reasons, for geopolitical reasons, uh, for cultural reasons, for, for strategic reasons, for economic reasons. Um, in Kievan Rus princess uh, and the Russian state in its, in its narrative uh, it draws its, it, 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 its, it, uh, the creation of the Russian state to Kievan Rus. Uh, Kievan Rus princess received Christianity in Constantinople, that is, uh, it, as Istanbul used to be called. Um, and so for, from, from a religious standpoint, Constantinople uh, in the Muslim world was, it was incredibly uh, important. Um, although I would argue geo geopolitics are probably the most profound uh, factor. Uh, the, the, the Russian state expanded uh, for most of its history, uh, as I'm sure uh, you're aware. And um, as the Russian state expanded, it, it absorbed lands and peoples on its periphery. Uh, the expansion of the Russian state was, was similar uh, to probably closer to how the Ottoman Empire expanded to how European empires expanded, right? Because uh, the British, for example, conquered lands, uh, colonized lands that were geographically separate um, uh, from, from Great Britain, but Russia absorbed lands around it. And as it um, absorbed uh, the lands and incorporated its peoples into, its, uh, into the Russian Empire, uh, paradoxically, uh, the state uh, was distrustful uh, it, it, of, of the people that it incorporated. It, um, uh, it, um, it felt it needed more buffer zones for security. And so Russian expansion was always characterized by this self-perpetuating cycle of insecurity. That is, the more land uh, uh, the state conquered, the more insecure it felt and the more buffer zones it needed, and then it conquered more lands in the cycle. Uh, basically continued uh, over and over again. Uh, another uh, result of this is that uh, Muslim people became part of the Russian Empire. The very Russian identity uh, was shaped and changed uh, by, 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 these, uh, by these people. And in fact, uh, a British historian, uh, Jeffrey Hoskins, once said uh, Great Britain had an empire, but Russia was uh, an empire. Uh, and um, so, so, so this is a big uh, historic uh, difference between how the West developed and how Russia has developed. Frankly, uh, in the West, we tend to associate expansion uh, with wealth and power. But again, in the Russian case, it oftentimes brought not only more insecurity, but also more poverty, uh, poverty to the Russian people. So uh, the, the, the way uh, the Russian state developed uh, in relation to this region is, is very important uh, to understand. Um, as the Russian state grew, uh, Russia wanted to be a great power, in, including in Europe. Uh, and uh, because Russia was a land power, um, it, it, Russian rulers quickly understood that to be a great power, they needed naval access. They needed access to warm water ports. And so Russian, um, uh, Russian rulers uh, pursued consistently uh, since Tsarist time, times access to warm water ports, not just to the Black Sea, but also to the Eastern Mediterranean. In fact, Peter the Great used to dream uh, as far as far as far as the Red Sea. Uh, uh, so, for this reason, I think geopolitics are probably perhaps the most profound factor that influenced uh, the role Russia played uh, in this in this region, uh, and. Um, uh, and that is, uh, and that is uh, frankly, an interest that remains true uh, to this day. And this brings me to another point uh, that I wanted to make here, and that is that when we look at Putin's Russia in the Middle East, uh, there are certainly certain elements of Putin's approach to the region, uh, certain elements of, of, of Russian uh, foreign policy approach that are unique to him. But there are other aspects that have uh, historic uh, basically almost permanent uh, uh, interest as far as the Russian state goes. And those interests are gonna matter no matter who um, is in the Kremlin. And so there's many, there's many aspects of Putin's Syria intervention. One is Putin's own interests, but one, uh, but some uh, have to do with historic uh, Russian state interests as well. Uh, 
Um, and that is something that at the very least we need to uh, understand as we look at Russia in this region. Uh, Russia, uh, Tsarist Russia, again, as it expanded, it clashed with the Persian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, right? Russia was part of the Great Game. Uh, Iran uh, fought, or Persia, I should say, uh, fought two wars with the Russian Empire and lost both wars. Iran had to cede uh, lands to the Russian Empire in, in, in what we know what parts of Armenia and Azerbaijan and the South Caucasus. And by, by the way, I, in my understanding, those are pretty important lands for, for the Persian Empire. These were not merely peripheral uh, lands. So um, when Iran went to war with Russia, it tended to lose. And on average, this, uh, the Ottoman Empire had a fairly similar experience. Uh, the Ottoman Empire and Russia uh, fought approximately a dozen major and minor wars. And on balance, Russia tended to win more. And so historically, uh, both Iran and Turkey tend to have more fear of Russia than the other way around. There, there, there's very good reasons for that, and, and it's historic. Um, it, when the Bolsheviks uh, came on the political scene and as they uh, uh, seized power in Russia, uh, uh, Middle East again uh, played a prominent uh, role in their interests. So one of their, uh, one of the first acts of the Bolsheviks was to leak um, the secret uh, Sykes Picot Agreement into the Bolshevik um, mouthpiece newspaper Pravda to embarrass Western allies. So, uh, so the Middle East continued uh, to matter uh, to, to the Russian state as Bolsheviks came on the political scene and as the Cold War eventually uh, emerged as the key global geopolitical struggle. It is in the Middle East that one of the first major clashes, uh, major sort of pronouncements of the Cold War uh, had occurred. Uh, it happened when uh, Joseph Stalin refused to withdraw uh, from Soviet-occupied Iran after World War II. Uh, so the reason, so again, the reason I bring up these, the, these points is because it's just how important the Middle East has been historically uh, to great power competition um, uh, before, before the Soviet, even before the existence of the Soviet Union, great powers always competed for influence in this region. Uh, and um, uh, certainly as the Cold War uh, went into full swing, the Eastern Mediterranean again emerged as a, as a critically important arena of competition. Uh, between the, the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, especially mattered militarily because this was NATO southern flank, and the Soviets looked for ways to block, uh, to block NATO influence. And over time, the United States uh, rose to the challenge and pushed back uh, against Soviet influence, but, uh, but it took time. Uh, so this competition again unfolded during the Cold War. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union uh, was operating through, um, through communist ideology. The, the Soviet Union had a global mission uh, uh, that stood fundamentally opposed uh, to that of the United States. And, and it stood opposed to, to ideas of liberty and freedom. Um, and uh, everything that the Soviet Union had done in this region was through this ideological communist lens. The Soviet Union had clear allies in the region and clear patrons that they cultivated. And it also had clear enemies. Uh, Soviet Union also cultivated uh, terrorists and sent to train terrorists uh, in the Middle East. In fact, one uh, a former Soviet general uh, once famously bragged that uh, airplane hijackings were his own invention. Uh, so uh, that was the Cold War. And of course, the United States competed with the, the, the USSR in this region as well. Um, with the end of the Cold War, um, Russia briefly and partially retreated from the Middle East. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, Russia entered a very unique uh, period in its, um, in its history, probably the only time when Russia was somewhat absent from this region. Uh, and this has to do with a whole host of, of, of reasons. Uh, Yeltsin personally was less interested in the Middle East. Overall, Russia was simply looking more inward um, uh, after they lost the Cold War. In the early years of Yeltsin, Russia was more uh, Western oriented and was simply more interested in building a, a relationship with the West and so forth. So there were many reasons for this. But the fact of the matter is, um, Russia no longer had this historic presence in the 19, in, in, in 1990s as it did for most of its existence um, as a state. Having said that, uh, Russia still had relations with uh, Turkey uh, and Iran uh, and retained connections to Hezbollah uh, and Syria, but, uh, but this was no longer the Cold War. Um, an important uh, point uh, to note um, that, that's relevant to this discussion um, is, um, is a man named Evgeny Primakov, who came on the Russian political scene in 1996 when he became uh, Russian, uh, Russian foreign minister uh, and took over, took over from a uh, more pro-Western oriented uh, Andrei Kozina. 
uh, Primakov, uh, who also had a background in intelligence, uh, um, spoke fluent Arabic. He started out as, uh, as an Arabic translator in the Middle East. Uh, Primakov um, put forth uh, publicly uh, a vision for Russian policy of as pursuing a multipolar world. Um, in this vision, um, uh, this was a more hawkish, more anti-Western approach uh, than, again, that his predecessor had taken. Uh, the idea of a multipolar world ultimately entailed uh, Russia building, uh, Russia perceiving the U.S.-led global order as disadvantaging Russia, as being chaotic, destabilizing, and what have you. Uh, and um, in this vision, Russia had to compete. Russia had to work with other great powers. And this implied returning Russia to regions where it historically played a prominent role. And this included the Middle East, especially because Primakov in particular had a unique uh, background in this region. So the, the seeds of what Putin was going to do in the Middle East ultimately go back to Primakov. Uh, Putin's overall approach to the Middle East is ultimately Primakov's vision of a multipolar world. And I wanted to highlight that this began in the mid 1990s before Putin was even, uh, before Putin was ever on the political scene to the extent that, that he was. Um, so this is by, none of this is by all means new. To the contrary, there are fairly deep uh, roots in, to, what, to what Russia is pursuing in the Middle East. Uh, Putin, uh, by the time he came on to, uh, by the time he became president, um, uh, began pursuing a very consistent approach to the region. Uh, and it was fundamentally different from how the Soviet Union approached it. Uh, Russia was no longer going to approach it through an ideological lens of communism. Instead, Russia was going to be pragmatic. Russia was going to build relations with all uh, powers in the Middle East, uh, all governments in the Middle East, and opposition to them. Uh, this vision was, uh, and again, uh, note that this was a more flexible approach. Uh, Primakov, just like Putin, uh, they, they both studied the end of the Soviet Union very carefully. They, they studied the reasons for its demise. The fact of the matter is uh, many who were in uh, the KGB uh, were not ignorant at all of Soviet um, uh, failures and mistakes that they've made, not from any moral uh, reasons, but from a reason, but simply from a standpoint of what it, of, of, of Soviet collapse or why the Soviet Union ultimately lost the Cold War. Um, like uh, like a number of other people uh, in that circle, ultimately could not um, forgive that um, uh, that that uh, that the Soviet Union lost. Um, and uh, you, I'm sure everybody here remembers his famous comment about how the, the fall of the Soviet the, the breakup of the Soviet Union being one of the greatest or the greatest excuse me, the greatest uh, tragedy of, of the 21st century. Um, the comment was, I think, misunderstood a little bit in the sense that some might have thought that uh, Putin wanted to bring communism back. No, this was a lament for uh, losing Russia's great power status. Uh, and that loss was unacceptable to him. Uh, ultimately, uh, much of what Putin has done was basically to try to play out the Cold War with an alternate ending. Uh, and I think that remains the case. Um, to this day. The fact of the matter is the United States genuinely moved on with the end of the Cold War. Um, we believed that we won communism was uh, history. It was proven to be uh, ineffective, but also brutal uh, and cruel. And uh, it seemed that um, th that vision belonged in the past. Uh, what we were, I think, unprepared for and didn't pay enough attention to is to how Russia, well, how, how Russia would interpret it. Uh, these events and what what uh, what the Russian government was going to do, uh, and uh, the Middle East uh, is one one key arena where this interest has been in full display. Uh, this lecture is uh, again it says the word global um, in it, and um, the reason why this is important is because as uh, many commentators have looked at Putin's Russia over the years. Uh, they tended to, uh, again, focus on uh, uh, Russia's relations with Europe, uh, uh, Russia's domestic situation, and so forth. And it is important. Um, but, but there is a global dimension to what Putin is trying to achieve. And the, it, he does bring an alternative vision uh, to, to the Middle East and to other regions where he's involved. Again, it's, it's, it's more limited than, the, than communism was. It is more pragmatic uh, in scope, but it is an alternative vision of an authoritarian uh, power. 
an authoritarian government as an alternative to a liberal uh, liberal form of government. And uh, for this reason, the Middle East, from the, as far as the Russian government is concerned, remains an arena of great power um, competition. Um, so uh, to go back to Putin's, uh, Putin's approach to the region, uh, as Putin pursued these uh, pragmatic ties with all powers in the Middle East, um, uh, it, it, please keep that multipolar world framework uh, in mind. Uh, and Putin has done this through a variety of ways. It wasn't necessarily, sometimes these steps were not major. Um, it was through a number of uh, personal uh, visits. Putin made a number of unprecedented visits to the region that uh, no other Russian uh, head of government had done. Um, it was also through forgiveness of debt. For example, in mid-2000s, um, the Russian government had forgiven a number of countries, like, for example, Syria and Libya, uh, billions of dollars worth of debt in exchange for better trade deals and in exchange for arms sales and so forth. Um, it, it was also it was through building better commercial um, relationships. It was it, as well as through eventually establishing um, uh, uh, better channels for Russian soft power projection through uh, uh, through RT Arabic um, and, and Sputnik. Uh, so uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, so all of these steps. Putin had taken way before protests had broke out uh, in Syria. And by 2010, um, when the Arab Spring broke out, uh, the Russian government had already built these good relations with all governments in the region, as well as uh, major opposition movements to them. Now, the, the Arab Spring scared Putin. Um, and I should backtrack here a little bit. Um, not only did the Arab Spring scare Putin, um, but the US intervention in Iraq scared Putin. Uh, the color, the so-called color revolutions in post-Soviet space uh, scared Putin, and uh, domestic protests against Putin himself as well. In all of these acts, uh, in all of these domestic protests, peaceful protest uh, acts, Putin saw the hand of the West, and he was absolutely convinced that, um, th that the United States had sponsored these regimes. And, and the reason why I think he's convinced is because, as I've said before, we had moved on during the Cold War, uh, after the Cold War, but he has not. Uh, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union pursued uh, th these types of tactics, pursued fomenting unrest, and basically, in short, uh, Putin believes that this is what we did because this is what he himself would do, I think. That, 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 that's my view, at least. Um, Putin, it, it is said that Putin had watched obsessively um, uh, two particular videos, uh, uh, both of which pertain to the Middle East. One uh, is the execution of Saddam Hussein, and the other is of uh, the killing of Muammar Gaddafi. Um, he watched it, um, it is said, supposedly with, with the view that, that this is what Americans do to leaders in this region, to authoritarians, and, and this is what he needs to worry about himself. So this, 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 this belief that we're out to get him, basically, I think, um, uh, guided, uh, uh, guided his, uh, his, his approach. When it came to a domestic protest in, protest in Russia, Russian officials said directly uh, and openly that, in their view, it was the U.S. State Department that gave protesters the signal to come out. Um, so, uh, in, in, in a sense, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an, uh, a, a very firm link between Russian domestic and foreign policy to the extent that might be hard to understand the West. Um, by propping up authoritarians, as Putin is doing in the Middle East, he's also if, if, he's also ensuring, in his view, his own seat in power. Because if he prevents the United States from ousting another authoritarian leader, Russia is uh, Russia is perceived as a stronger power, and uh, the United States will be less inclined to uh, supposedly uh, you know, sponsor protests uh, in Russia. So this domestic link, uh, uh, this domestic driver of Russian foreign policy under Putin is, is very uh, important. Um, Syria, of course, um, uh, has had a unique uh, special relationship that, uh, with Russia that went back to the Cold War. Um, and when protests broke out in Syria, in particular in March 2011, um, the fact of the matter is Putin had done uh, everything he could short of a military intervention to keep, to prop up Assad. He had provided Assad with loans, uh, with weapons, with diplomatic cover on the UN Security Council. If you look at early uh, Security Council in, uh, in UN general discussions, uh, Putin was always supporting Assad. The Russian, the Russian, Russian delegations always supported Assad. Um, so the fact of the matter is, uh, before 2015, 
Russia was already present heavily in Syria and was doing everything it could to make sure that Assad stayed in power. Uh, now, the intervention had taken many in the West by complete surprise. I don't think I don't think anybody really uh, uh, predicted that uh, in, in in Western governments that, that, that this was going to happen. And it, it, it was a huge surprise because uh, Russia had just annexed Crimea illegally from Ukraine. Russia wasn't fomenting a, a, a war uh, in eastern Ukraine, um, and surely uh, Russia wouldn't be able to fight a two front war, both in uh, Ukraine and uh, in Syria. Uh, this was one. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, the intervention came as such a surprise. Um, but if you look at ser ser several steps, uh, several events that happened before, in retrospect, at the very, at the very least, in retrospect, it should have been a logical conclusion, uh, because uh, uh, in Syria, the United States um, had never really committed firmly to a position. The West kept saying that Assad must go. Uh, uh, in two thousand thirteen. Uh, uh, President Obama said that um, that his red line for an intervention was going to be if Assad uses chemical weapons against his people, and Assad did. Very promptly, Assad used chemical weapons. Um, but uh, rather than commit to um, uh, to that promise, um, uh, 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 Obama hesitated, and Russia offered a way in. Russia offered to broker a uh, an agreement between Assad um, and and the West for removal of chemical weapons. Uh, there were many questions to be asked because uh, of how would a, you know one of Assad's biggest supporters was really going to disarm Assad, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it was a better deal um, uh, from the Western perspective because that it staved off it, it prevented an intervention with, for which there was very little appetite for in the West. Um, the fact of the matter is, chemical attacks in Syria, smaller ones, continued afterwards. So many questions were, were raised almost immediately about whether or not. The removal of Assad's chemical weapons was complete. Of his chemical weapons arsenal was complete. Um, uh, but it, but the West was clearly signaling ambiguity, uh, and Putin read it as weakness. Uh, it, it, the, perhaps the red line is the, the, the sort of the failure, the, the non implementation of the red line is probably the clearest, most stark example of how Putin read our intentions correctly. And having read those intentions correctly, uh, it's not really that surprising that ultimately he intervened um, in September 2015 uh, to prop up Assad. And certainly the intervention, the military intervention was a, a major game changer. It, uh, uh, it immediately brought Russia formally back uh, onto the political scene uh, in the Middle East as a great power. Uh, and the region certainly took note uh, as well. Uh, the region took note of the fact that um, well, the West uh, said one thing and did another. Putin said very little, but he promised to save Assad and he did. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it was a game changer on multiple levels. But the fact of the matter is, it's not as if, you know, the point I'm trying to make is it's not as if there was no Russia uh, in, in the Middle East and in Syria and all of a sudden, you know, September 2015 hits and we have uh, Russia uh, entering the Syrian theater. That, that's not what happened. It, it seemed that way for many observers, but that's not what happened at all. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and this basically brings us, well, I wanted to say a few words before, uh, before I conclude, but I wanted to say a few words about uh, the intervention itself. Uh, first, officially, Putin uh, and other senior Russian uh, officials said that they were intervening in Syria to prevent terrorists from uh, coming into Russia. To staging attacks on Russian soil. Um, but what uh, what you could see immediately from Russian actions is that they were simply not targeting radicals. They were not targeting ISIS or the al Nusra group. The weapons that, that they brought into Syria uh, were not weapons that would help fight ISIS. For example, they immediately brought into aircraft um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, it's it's um, uh, ISIS never had an air force. They brought it basically. They brought in weaponry to shoot down airplanes. But ISIS never had an air force. So who were they really targeting if, 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 they, if they had weaponry to shoot down aircraft? Um, Russia very quickly set up uh, this weaponry uh, and basically uh, bring, after bringing in this, 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 um, the, the military, these, these were elite forces, by the way, uh, from the Russian military that had come in. Uh, what, the, what their actions were clearly showing is that they were looking to deter the West uh, as a bigger priority than fighting ISIS. Um, saving Assad uh, was also their chief priority over fighting uh, ISIS. Um, 
Syria also encapsulated a whole host of other Russian uh, state interests fairly uniquely, like perhaps like no other Russian state. And I, I would say they were probably uh, secondary. The, the biggest priority uh, of, of this act, what, what this shows is Russia was trying to push back against the US-led global order. They were trying to deter the West they were trying to reduce uh, American influence by propping up Assad. Um, there were a whole host of others, and but unfortunately, this this um, what many observers had missed at the time is this this uh, 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 is this uh, global power dynamic. Uh, perhaps because nobody wanted to believe it. Because um, um, uh, there were a whole host of other reasons. Russia wanted to have dialogue with the West on its terms, and it was isolated during um, uh, um, in the post Crimea uh, 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 situation, where it was uh, where Russia was uh, sanctioned even more than it was uh, before. Western leaders stopped talking to Russia. Well, Syria was the one place uh, where Western officials, whether they liked it or not, now had to talk to Russia. Uh, simply if, if for no other reason than to avoid clashes. Um, earlier in the intervention, Russia had hoped or at least toyed with the idea of uh, getting sanctions removed also in exchange for co cooperation in Syria that ultimately didn't really pan out and I think they've given up on this goal, but this was another, seemed to be another early objective. Uh, arms sales. Uh, arms sales were very uh, were, were another important objective, um, and you could see Russia immediately using Syria as an advertising arena for new and existing weaponry, and also, frankly, simply getting rid of cheap munition uh, very uh, quickly and, and, and inexpensively. Uh, World water ports again, Tartus, uh, Russia's uh, only outpost outside the former Soviet Union. Uh, Tartus got a big boost. Russia also established an air base called Crimean. Uh, so Russia's historic uh, search for world water ports absolutely played out again um, in Syria. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned earlier, this was not the first Russian intervention in the Levant. Uh, Catherine the Great occupied uh, Beirut, what is now Beirut, um, several centuries earlier. Uh, so for all the descriptions of um, this intervention being unprecedented, there was a, there actually was precedent. It's just that it was so far uh, along that many had forgotten about it. Um, uh, and this, uh, you know, this basically brings us to the present. Uh, more or less, I'll, I'll uh, conclude with a few remarks, and, and we'll open it up to question. Uh, Russia now has, in many ways, succeeded where the Soviet Union had failed. Uh, it has a permanent military presence on the East, Eastern Mediterranean, and for the next, at least for the next forty-nine years, they've established an agreement with Syria for the next 49 years. And it is using it to project power throughout the region, uh, literally and figuratively, literally by shipping uh, contractors into Libya, but also figuratively as a, as a status, uh, simply as a status of power. Um, in many ways, Putin's pragmatism in the Middle East, again, was more successful uh, than that of the Soviet Union uh, because of how much influence Putin has been able to achieve. The Soviet Union ultimately, no matter how hard it tried, communism uh, could not take root. Uh, many uh, many people in this region distrusted the um, uh, the anti-religious uh, aspect of communism. This Russia is very different, um, and because it is more pragmatic, um, it, its ability to stay in the region, its ability to uh, thwart American influence, um, is also um, is also something we need to take seriously. It is it, Russia is clearly there for the long term, and I think if there was any doubt about it several years ago. I don't think there's any doubt um, now. Last thing I will say, um, and, and this, is, this, this point is also a subject of my book. Uh, when uh, Putin intervened in Syria, uh, many uh, observers and President Obama himself had famously said that Russia will find itself stuck in a quagmire, that it's an intervention that's not going to work, that it's going to backfire against Russia and also Iran, I think, uh, as to both of them are cheap to Assad's uh, backers. Um, the fact of the matter is this intervention was designed precisely to not get Russia stuck in a quagmire. One of the things I talk about in my book is um, I, I talk about the Soviet Afghanistan intervention and how different uh, the Syria intervention was. From a military and political standpoint, this intervention in Syria shows a number of key lessons learned. Uh, Russia is worried about getting uh, being stuck in another Afghanistan. Uh, precisely because the trauma of that experience uh, was was still fresh um, in their memories. So this was an intervention designed to use few resources to get other actors to do most of the heavy lifting. Um, and if any, and it paid dividends not just uh, commercially with arms sales, but politically, uh, regionally. 
um, but because both American allies and adversaries have come to accept Russia as a reality in the Middle East that is now there uh, to stay and like it or not, they have to deal with it. Um, and perhaps I'll conclude here, Russia is a reality that like it or not, um, we have to deal with. And I'll end there with we'll closing questions. Uh, Mike Knickerbocker, I'm the uh, Department of the Navy Fellow at the Clement Center for National Security. I, I was actually uh, on one of the four destroyers that responded to the 2013 chemical weapons attack. It spent about six months sitting off the coast of Syria. But in late 2012, uh, we were watching uh, you know, every six to 10 days, LSTs bringing conventional weapons. Uh, even in 2012, 2013, prior to the chemical weapons attack, we saw the installation of advanced uh, air detection radars. And, and, you know, as much as we focus on the conventional munitions, mm -hmm. there was a significant uh, land attack, cruise missile, and uh, similar to what we've seen now in Crimea since its annexation in 2014, they quickly started building up uh, you know, air defense systems in 2012, 13. And then after the chemical weapons attack, uh, they brought the Kuznetsov carrier strike group into the Eastern Mediterranean, which it hadn't done a deployment in like three years. So how much of that early intervention in Syria do you think was more there to also deter the strengthening of Turkish NATO ties? Because by maintaining uh, and strengthening their position in uh, TARDIS, uh, they gained more access to the Turkish-controlled port on uh, Cyprus uh, in Larnaca because uh, the U.S. primarily uses Limassol. And uh, they're then able to hold at risk Turkish interests, which now we're seeing since this time that Turkey has started to reacquire uh, Russian systems and been a little looser in its uh, commitment to NATO. So where do you think that those in 2012 leading up to what we all identify as the September 2015 intervention when really it kind of started three, four years before that. Right, well, first of all, I'm really, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that you were also able to see that um, because I think it will, uh, not, not everybody will, um, at least in the uh, foreign policy circles was aware of Russian buildup uh, in, in those early years. But it, again, it goes to my point that it wasn't just like there was no Russia in, in prior to 2015, all of a sudden Russia appeared. No, it wasn't like that at all, no. right? Um, uh, I think uh, it, it is a great point that you bring up. Um, uh, I, Turkey always mattered for, uh, as, uh, so building deterrence against Turkey always mattered to Putin. Um, and it's not just in the military realm, but, I, but, but the military realm is part of it. This goes back, this Russian idea of war, the very idea of how Russia fights war and what it does in war is also very different from how we think of war. War is not just conventional uh, weaponry, uh, right? And uh, Putin, with regard to Turkey, Putin has done a, a lot in, in even the earlier years, even before 2012, uh, to build a, a bilateral relationship with Turkey in a way that was that it was skewed more in Russia's favor. Uh, so on trade, trade for example, the, the, the bilateral trade relationship between Russia and Turkey is uh, more advantageous to Russia than the other way around. And one of it, one of it has it, one piece of it has to do with Russian tourists. Right? Turkey is heavily dependent on Russian tourists. Um, oh, there are a number of foodstuffs and other uh, um, items that Turkey imports. Uh, so when uh, uh, when uh, Turkey, I'm sure you remember this episode very well, when Turkey shut down, accidentally shut down Russian plane in Syria, uh, right after the intervention, uh, what Putin did is he uh, uh, basically turned on this tap of, uh, uh, of economic influence. There were, he stopped, the trade was, was frozen, there were some sanctions. Uh, Russian tourists stopped coming to Turkey. And economically, Turkey felt it. Right? Um, so, uh, so that's one aspect of that relationship. Uh, Russia is also building Turkey's nuclear power plant, mm -hmm. uh, and it also carries out information operations uh, through Sputnik. The irony of Sputnik, a Turkish Sputnik, is that because Turkish media has been so heavily uh, uh, controlled and really eviscerated by, by Erdogan, uh, many Turkish journalists they were, could, could only get a job at Sputnik. And uh, ironically, many Turks perceive Sputnik as the only source of, as the only alternative to, to the news, to Turkish news. Uh, and because these are fairly good journalists, frankly, I've been told at least that the quality of, of, the, of their work is, is pretty good. It's, it's, it's convincing. Um, 
uh, Sputnik is also critical of Erdogan uh, inside Turkey, which is very interesting. Um, and so uh, I, I think, uh, so Turkey, uh, I think if basically if Putin was setting a trap for Erdogan years and years ago, and I think it took Erdogan too long to realize where he was. Uh, finally, another lever of influence is Russia's relationship with the Kurds. And by the way, after that incident with the plane, uh, uh, Kurdish uh, uh, opposition leaders had come to, to Moscow, PYD opened an office in Moscow, and they made uh, public, uh, several public remarks as a signal, basically, an indirect signal to, uh, to Erdogan that Russia has that relationship with the Kurds. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I think it's quite possible that that buildup uh, that, that, that you're describing was another lever of influence in the Russia-Turkey uh, relationship. Um, they, and the way these things happen with Russia too, they, they usually test, they take small steps and they test uh, and they see what the reaction is. There, there, to my knowledge, there just wasn't a whole lot of a serious reaction uh, to, to those steps, not enough to deter them uh, at least. And so, so uh, deterring Turkey was uh, probably another uh, objective. Um, I do think propping up Assad and sort of laying out the, the sort of seeing what they can do to help Assad was probably another. Thank you. Hi, hi, my name is Kate. Um, I'm an undergraduate senior here at UT. And you mentioned earlier your talk about Putin's pragmatic approach to the Middle East, and one of those components being building up Russia's soft power channels um, through media. And so uh, I know we just got off of the Sputnik RT talk, <laughs> but I hate to bring it back. I was wondering how, especially, you know, Russia's narratives getting to the people, how would they really legitimize their intervention within Syria to bolster the Assad regime that has conducted these chemical weapon attacks? on its own people, if it's in the same case as Turkey, where really RT and Sputnik are perhaps the only other media outlets for journalism and news other than the Assad regime uh, networks. Do you mean that the, how, did the, how did the Russian government get this message to the Russian people or to the region? Oh, I'm sorry, to the region. To yes, the region. Or just to Syrians in general. Like what narratives, if you can answer that, like are they being forward to justify their intervention in Assad's government? Uh, their narrative is that, uh, that Assad never used chemical weapons, that the West made that up. Um, that it was in reality opposition. Uh, their narrative is also that, that there was no real investigation. In reality, by the way, Russia blocked meaningful investigation into chemical weapons uh, attacks. Uh, but their narrative is simply that Assad didn't do it and that, uh, and, and that really it's a, that the West that the West made up. Thank you. That leading up to the intervention, Putin did everything that he could to support Assad. Obviously, 2015 happened. They intervened militarily. Now they have their military presence on the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, the the Syrian conflict is basically reaching a plateau at this point and, and not moving in in, a, in either direction. I, I'm asking you to bring out your crystal ball. And what do you see? Um, does this status quo stay for the next foreseeable for the foreseeable future, next 20 years? Uh, what do you see Putin's policy changing? Um, He's even said that maybe not Assad is the permanent solution, that he might be amenable to somebody else. Like, what do you see happening um, in the future? So currently Assad, uh, looking at what's happening right now in the region, Assad is looking at increasing normalization, increasing acceptance by the Arab leaders, by Arab leaders who had, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the last 10 years, had shunned him. There's discussion about readmitting Assad into the Arab League. Uh, and um, so the, the, one of the most tragic consequences of this is that, um, that, is that a man who barrel bombed his population, gassed his population with chemical weapons, uh, created one of the worst um, refugee crises um, in, in modern history, uh, and, and, and a displacement that is frankly going to haunt us for many years to come. Um, that this is a type of person that is now gradually looking at acceptance. Um, and this shows what happens when um, the United States is absent um, from, uh, from the scene. Um, it's, um, and, you know, these steps right now, I think there's, um, looking into a crystal ball, I think uh, normalization discussion will probably continue and intensify because many, many, uh, uh, many uh, officials from this region will say, well, we've tried talking to Assad. Uh, oh, sorry, we tried isolating Assad. We, we've expelled him and it didn't achieve things. Uh, he's still in power. So uh, like it or not, we, maybe it's time to try um, other tactics. And 
And that in and of itself is, is quite telling. Uh, for anybody who thought that, um, that Russian intervention was not going to succeed or achieve uh, anything in Syria, uh, I, I think this current situation shows just how much, how, how wrong that, that was. Um, in my view, Syria is going to become a frozen conflict. And, and this is what I argue in my book uh, as well. Uh, Russia is, uh, is not interested in uh, uh, replacing the United States because it can't. It doesn't have the resources. It, it, it's fundamentally, it, it doesn't have the desire. Uh, it is interested in being perceived as a peacemaker. And what it does throughout the region is because it builds relationships with everybody on the ground, it positions itself as a mediator between everybody. And you can find it on micro levels and macro levels in the region. So Russia positions itself, for example, as a mediator, mediator between Assad and the SDF. Uh, in Syria specifically, between Turkey and the SDF, between uh, Turkey and Assad. So uh, it was Russia actually that served as a guarantor of a whole slew uh, of ceasefires in Syria, all of whom had ultimately broken down. Um, and uh, because they're not, they have neither the desire nor ability to bring forth a genuine resolution. Uh, I think what you're going to have is a frozen conflict. Uh, very similar to frozen conflicts that we see in the post-Soviet space. There are a lot of advantages to maintaining frozen conflicts. That's why Russia maintains frozen conflicts. Um, because it, uh, because if, if, a if, one thing, if a conflict is ultimately resolved, then nobody needs Russia. But if, if you have, uh, if serious fighting goes down and you have low level tensions that Russia can manage, that means everybody needs Russia. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, other Russian uh, officials have said over the years that um, for as long as there's been stability in the Middle East, there will be a need for Russian weapons, for Russian presence. So, so this low level uh, conflict, it may not even be an ideal scenario for Russia, but it's one that they can live with for a very long time. We in the West, we often uh, think that everybody wants a solution, that everybody comes in with, and then they want the same things as we do. Um, but Russians can live with an unresolved situation for a long time. Yeah, um, aside from the red line, which you did allude to, another issue was the no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, uh, could you give us a little more background on why the United States decided not to impose a no-fly no zone? And if it had, what would be your speculation on whether the rest of the scenario that you provided on Russia's presence in Syria would have changed. Thank you for this question. A uh, very important question. Uh, yes, in fact, at the time, I also uh, argued that we needed to have a no-fly zone. Um, it, I, in, in my understanding, um, uh, because there was so little appetite for an intervention in Syria uh, by, the, by the West, in the West, uh, when Russia entered uh, the Syrian theater, and because it was so uh, unexpected, uh, what, many West, what many Western officials feared was going to war with Russia. And what they didn't want to do is fight a war with Russia over Syria. Um, unfortunately, uh, many people looked at the situation in very binary terms as an either or, a, a total all or nothing proposition. Uh, I continue to believe that if in those years, those early years, we had uh, uh, set up a no-fly zone, I don't think there would have been a war with Russia. Um, I don't think Russia was interested in fighting a real war with us. One thing it's a fight they'd lose, and they know that. Um, also, I don't think it would have been very popular domestically um, with the Russian people. Uh, fighting a full-on conventional war with Russia, I don't think that's something that that, uh, that, that would have gone over well on, on, any, on any level. I think oftentimes Putin, what Putin gets away with is because he threatens the possibility of war. Um, and we don't, we don't have the same deterrent. We often don't make him think that we will fight back. Um, you know, there's this great expression, weakness is provocative, and I'm not the one who said it, I forget who said it. Uh, but by acting, uh, by acting weak, by acting in a way that Putin perceived as weak, put it this way. I'm, I'm not sure if it was intended to be as weak, but Putin perceived it as weak. Uh, we further emboldened him to, to move on. Um, 
um, I, th th there could have been legal arguments made as well. That th th there, the fact of the matter is there was legal precedent for no fly zone uh, for Operation uh, Flight Comfort. So you could you could find arguments uh, of in terms of precedent, but I think ultimately it came down to little appetite, uh, little interest, and perhaps overblown fears. Uh, of, of fighting a war with Russia over Syria, which again, I, I think if, if it were to happen, I think if we were to uh, set up a, a no-fly zone at the time, at the time, do I, I don't think, it's not as if the Syrian tragedy would have been resolved miraculously, it would have been, it was too complicated and this was one piece, but I do think that it would have signaled greater commitment on the part of the West uh, of, for humanitarian support. And uh, it would it, it would have won greater respect uh, as as again as, as as showing commitment goes. And we may very well have still been talking about Syria, but I think it would have been a different conversation. So um, you've talked a lot about uh, Russia's strategic uh, involvement in the Middle East and with uh, the occupied forces or um, the U.S., British, and French leaving Afghanistan. Do you think that Russia will attempt to try and pick up there again, even though they've tried, it hasn't worked? Do you see that as a potential, like another space for them to go for? Oh, oh thank you for the question. Well, first of all, I, I think um, uh, they've been, uh, as far as their propaganda messaging, they've been looking as far as worse. Uh, um, the, 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 from, uh, from high to low level, uh, the message that the United States have failed, uh, in Afghanistan has been nonstop. Uh, the idea, and uh, again, this narrative that, well, the United States is a destabilizing force, look at them, they try to come in, they destroy local societies and they ultimately fail and create chaos. That, that, that narrative um, has been playing out over and over again, like broken record. Um, uh, Russia was already in Afghanistan. Um, Russia had opened a channel of communication with the Taliban um, as early as at least 2014, although some sources suggest earlier. And uh, Russia also had a relationship with the, the now deposed Afghan, Afghan government. In, in some ways, uh, the, the, um, the template that the Russian government had applied to Afghanistan of building connections with all major players, uh, what they, did, they, they didn't just do that in the Middle East, they did that in, the, in Afghanistan as well. Uh, Russia was also uh, working for years on strengthening its position in Central Asia. Uh, and uh, China has been there as well, but China's, China's presence there is more, at this stage more economic. Uh, from a security standpoint, uh, Central Asia still looks to Russia as a security guarantor. And th th it's, it's a much more significant position um, that, was, that, that Russia had in the 1990s. Um, also, the writing was on the wall. Uh, it, it, I think Putin expected the United States to withdraw from Afghanistan. And um, so I think what he has been preparing um, to make sure that he has control in Central Asia, to make sure that he has access uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I do think Russia will uh, remain uh, will remain a key player in Afghanistan as well. Yes, uh, uh, Russia, just like China, uh, kept its embassy open uh, during the, the the debacle of our withdrawal. If I may uh, speak uh, directly. Um, and uh, uh, that showed a degree of confidence um, that, that, uh, that they had security, uh, that they were, they were short of their security. Um, I, I think uh, judging by Putin's statements, uh, he's also basically, I think that Russia is going to recognize the Taliban uh, uh, fairly soon. And Putin basically said as much several weeks ago when uh, he made a comment, I believe it was uh, in a meeting with, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, with Angela Merkel, where he said Russia is, a, uh, sorry, the Taliban is a reality that we have to deal with. Um, it is, um, um, I think also for all of these attempts uh, to have relations with everybody, they've concluded that the Taliban have come out the winner. And I think they're betting uh, on, on the Taliban. So we're leaving it back. And when you leave it back, of course, other actors are going to fill it. And you had you had a question. question. No, I, I was just going to say in, in uh, reference to the why we didn't uh, set a no-fly mm -hmm. zone. There's a few things militarily you have to do that, and we couldn't achieve those. We didn't have a permissive environment, and we didn't have the projection to achieve maritime supremacy. Uh, mm -hmm. We could maybe get superiority, but the reality is, is they had a lot of third and fourth generation Russian aircraft as early as like you know 2008 to 2010. So even by 2012, 13. 
they still had enough SA6s, SA26s, and uh, SU29s and 33s that they could, that Syria just on their own with what they had already purchased from Russia would deny us a permissive environment. It would have required uh, a significant amount of ordinance to be able to set the terms in order to impose a no-fly zone. So just militarily, it wasn't worth the uh, risk of entanglement. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure. And I'm not a technical military expert to the extent that you are. And um, uh, I'm sure that those conversation, conversations went, went, went down. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's an absolute uh, assessment. But I, I, again, I mean, I, I take your point on the risk of entanglement. Um, that, was, that was a concern. But uh, I, I'm not sure if that's, if that's the final uh, analysis. At this point, we'll never know. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, the story of Putin, in my mind, is, is largely a story of our failure to be able to deter him yes. from doing a lot of things. Yes. Okay, and yes. so Syria is an example. And you gave an example of a no-fly zone. I think what you're saying, what he's saying is you would have to go to war to be able to create the conditions to, to impose a no-fly zone. You'd have to destroy their air defense systems. I, I get that, but... I'm looking for, I'm actually listening very carefully, not just to your talk, but other places too. I think we're gonna, as you said multiple times, Putin sees a lot of things when we see, when we show restraint, he reads weakness. Yes. And he actually, in many cases, I think and you said this is accurately yes. reading, you know, like a, a fear of war as a policy gives the other guy a lot of room to maneuver. Yes. And so what are the things that we can do? So you mentioned like a no-fly zone um, in, in, in terms of not going to war, but risking or uh, drawing a line. You know, what are the kinds of things we I'm thinking of things like cyber attacks and thinking of things like direct interference in U.S. elections or in uh, trying to deepen, um, deepen differences to the point of causing violence in the United States. I mean, what are, do you have any ideas about how we could deter those those behaviors with Putin? What would he short of a full war? Right. I think uh, I think sometimes credible use of force in certain uh, parts of the world should be on the table. Credible threat of use of force, and, and again, this goes back to your point. Uh, we he's never really Putin has never really suffered. Um, uh, he's never really paid a price. Uh, for what he has done. You can argue that there were sanctions and that sanctions hurt. Um, uh, and hurt yet, Russia. 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 It didn't hurt him. Um, yes, they've caused some, some economic pain, but he's never really suffered uh, consequences. Every time there was a crisis, um, ultimately he thought he, he what, the lesson uh, that he took out of it is that he, he was getting away with it. Uh, because the West, again, uh, to, to your point earlier, because the West was afraid to take on any steps that might ultimately lead to, to war. And I mean, you know, what, what you could do, you, cyber is, is actually a perfect example because uh, this goes to the broader issue of the future of war. Uh, we, in conventional terms, the United States has a superior military. There's no rival uh, to the United States in conventional terms. Uh, but when it comes to issues like cyber, AI, artificial intelligence, um, um, using uh, contractors, basically using uh, means that are non-conventional uh, as, as tools of, of conflict, as tools of war. I think that's where, that's where, that, that's where some of the future of, of, of conflict is, is, is headed, precisely because our adversaries understand that they cannot take us on directly. And so they're looking for indirect ways. It, it's a strategy of limited means. So I think, yeah, I think using cyber, using information operations, um, and, 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 and during the Cold War, we understood uh, how to do counter propaganda. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, you know, even from my personal experience, um, I was born in, this, in the last years of the Soviet Union. My parents uh, used to listen to Radio Free Europe and uh, Voice of America. Um, people like my parents, and there were many of them, they knew that the Soviet government was lying to them. They knew that the voice of Voice of America was the voice of truth. Um, and uh, they, they wanted to hear the voice of America. There were a lot of people who wanted to hear the voice of America. We no longer have that voice. We've lost, um, uh, we're very confused and muddled in our own messaging. 
and it's simply a matter of being uh, of, of being more direct about the truth. Um, a perfect example of this is uh, Russia has a narrative that they are a humanitarian, they are provider of humanitarian aid in Syria. They if they bring in a few, uh, uh, you know, bags of grain. Uh, it's all over RT. Um, uh, uh, they they're very good at projecting their narrative, and it's very different from reality. What we need to do is project reality that we're, we're not projecting what we're actually doing. Um, so. Uh, 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 there are multiple ways we, um, the, the multiple means and tools that go short of a full blown war that we can employ. It has to, it has to start with a recognition that Russia is competing with us globally. Um, again, it's a, it's a limited strategy, a strategy of a power that is recognizing that it has limited means. But if you recognize that Russia is competing with you, uh, that already structures your vision as to how you can fight back. We, 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 we can't even agree as to whether or not the Middle East right now is an arena of great power competition or a distraction from great power competition, right? Uh, or whether or not we should be competing for Middle East at all. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the reality, the current reality is not that we competed and lost, but that we failed to compete. Yes. Um, we talked about this a little upstairs, but... Um... So in my lifetime, I guess I would probably fall on the side that many of our adventures, or the U.S.'s adventures in the Middle East weren't exactly successful, um, specifically um, Syria, as you mentioned. How do we prevent that from happening in the next country or in the next conflict? Uh, it's a very broad question. I guess it depends a little bit on which region you're thinking about. But I think, you know, if I were to answer generally, first, I think we need to pay attention. Uh, we haven't been uh, paying attention to what Russia was doing in the Middle East for, for, for a long time. And that's why you spread and missed uh, uh, their steps. And actually, Putin is very consistent in what he does. He, uh, um, he, 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 does, he basically says what he's going to do. Um, so it shouldn't come as that much of a surprise. Um, so I think uh, uh, simply paying attention on a regular basis uh, and, again, recognizing that we are in a great power competition. Our, our national security strategy has outlined several years ago that the focus of our foreign policy shifting away from counterterrorism is a priority to great power competition. But because, uh, and I would argue because we have not focused on great power competition since the end of the Cold War, we forgot what it's like to, uh, to compete. Uh, Russia never stopped uh, competing as a great power. The, the idea, for, for Russia, geopolitics are eternal. Um, and so, so that they've never, they, they, they're not out of practice. I think we're out of practice and we need to get back into that, uh, that, that way of thinking. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, speaking of the next country or the great power competition, all these aspects of this conflict kind of resemble, in my opinion, uh, tapping to Taiwan and China a little bit, just like our reluctance to get involved. And, um, like if this happens again, and we're looking at this 50 years from now, what are the long, what do you think? The long-term ramifications are of countries kind of losing that trust in America as someone that can come in and help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that look, the ramifications are that other powers will uh, will fill in that vacuum if uh, more countries uh, come to perceive the United States as an unreliable partner. They, the uh, other more countries will turn to Russia and China and to other uh, other actors. I mean, that, that's the short answer. Uh, to your question, and, and it's going to be incredibly destabilizing. The, the vacuum that was left in Afghanistan, I, I think it, it is so, um, I think it'll take years for us to see the full effects of just how destabilizing uh, it, is, it is going to be. Um, we cannot, uh, it, it'll take several years before that becomes clear, but um, no, look, you're, in, in the Middle East, what, what that will also mean is you're not just going to have more great power competition, you won't even have more regional competition. Because um, it, it's not just that nature abhors a vacuum, of course it does. Uh, there has never been um, a power like the United States, a power with the same reach as the United States. Uh, when Great Britain uh, left the Middle East and ultimately ceded global power to the United States, uh, because the United States came in its place, I would argue, and maybe this is a debatable point, but it's a legitimate point to be made that it wasn't the transition was not um, not as chaotic, and uh, because you, you had another Western power uh, coming on the scene, um, 
there's nobody else like the United States. Uh, and the, the gap between what, what there is with the United States and what there is with American abscess is that much bigger because no country was ever able to match uh, the United States and its resources and its reach. And, um, I mean, yeah, and again, I can't stress enough with Afghanistan, it'll take several years before we'll really understand just how catastrophic it was. Thank you. Yes. Using the framework that you set forth, how does Russia handle its relationships with Israel? Uh, Putin has pursued a very pragmatic policy towards Israel. Uh, he, uh, uh, um, and of course, you know very well that the Soviet Union did not recognize Israel. There was not, <laughs> there was not recognition. There was, there was no relation. This year, Russia and Israel are celebrating 30 years of bilateral relations. Um, Putin has uh, come to perceive uh, Israel as very important uh, in the Middle East for a whole host of reasons. Um, it, it, just to name a few, uh, going back to the Cold War, uh, uh, because uh, it was clear that the Soviet Union's ideological blinkering, its uh, very hardline uh, attitude ultimately didn't yield as many advantages as they thought. Uh, Jackson Danik Amendment, for example, uh, I hope everybody knows what Jackson Danik Amendment is. Should I explain what that is? Right? Jackson Danik Amendment is a US law enacted in 1970, 1970s. Sorry. Uh, it, it, is, it is a law that uh, allowed um, minorities to immigrate from the Soviet Union uh, in exchange for granting a certain trade rights to the Soviet Union. So in other words, the Soviet Union wanted, uh, wanted trade. Even the Communist Soviet Union understood that trade was important. And they wanted trade, uh, but in exchange uh, due to pressure uh, from Jewish groups who wanted to immigrate from the Soviet Union, uh, uh, the, the West, uh, the, the West forced the Soviet Union to allow uh, minorities to leave, uh, and uh, it is actually through Jackson Manic that I ended up uh, in the United States. That my family ended up in the United States. Um, it was an incredibly powerful piece of legislation because it pressured the Soviet Union very effectively on its human rights policies, uh, and uh, that's something that uh, that um, people in the KGB could not have missed. Uh, the law of Jackson Bank, it's sometimes called, people refer to it as a Jewish law, but if you actually read the text of the legislation, it doesn't mention Jews, it just mentions a right to immigration. Um, and in fact, other minorities were inspired by the Jewish example to also lobby for their rights to, to, to immigrate as well. Um, what people like Primakov and like Putin had concluded um, is that uh, A, Jews were a formidable force in Western uh, politics, which is a debatable point, uh, frankly, but, um, but that was, I think, I think that's one of the conclusions that they drew. Uh, more broadly, uh, they drew uh, a conclusion that it was better to work with Israel, uh, to bring Israel into their kind of the fold than to be uh, antagonistic to it. Um, uh, look, a Russian uh, foreign ministry spokesman, Maria Zaharova, once famously said, if you want to know what happens in American politics, you talk to the Jews in Brooklyn. She's on the record saying that. And I think that shows, uh, I mean, that just shows so much about, uh, it highlights the misunderstanding of American politics that has anti-Semitic tones to it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, that was the conclusion that, that these people, um, that, that the Russian elites seem to have, to have reached. Um, having a good relationship with Israel also shields Putin from being from criticism of being too closely aligned with Iran. It goes uh, together with, and it, again, with this pol this approach that Putin has taken um, of being able to talk to opposing uh, forces in the Middle East. Um, so it, again, it positions Putin as a mediator between uh, Iran and Israel, between Hezbollah. Uh, in Israel. Hezbollah is not a, is, by the way, is not labeled as a terrorist organization in Russia. Hezbollah has paid several official visits to Moscow. Um, Hamas has also come to Moscow for official invitations as well. Uh, so uh, it, it's, you, you see, it's a more flexible, it's a more flexible approach. Um, there, there's uh, 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 Russia covets uh, technology from Israel. Uh, there, there's so many other um, uh, I mean, uh, so many other reasons, but ultimately, ultimately, if I were to sum it up, it's a very pragmatic, very pragmatic policy. I think that's going to be our, our last question. I want to thank you very much and uh, 